Since the early years of OSRS, the Slayer skill has been heavily prioritized by Jagex with getting more updates than any other skill over the years. Since 2013, there's been so many new bosses, rewards, training methods, gear, and more that have been added to Slayer. And rightfully so, seeing as how combat is such an important and large part of the game, this one skill alone opens up so much content. It's one of the best ways to progress an account, seeing as it helps you level up all your combat stats, which is 7 other skills skills on top of Slayer. It helps you earn a lot of gold that you'll use to train up other skills, or if you're an Iron Man, it allows you to collect the resources you need to train other skills and upgrade your gear that will help you take on higher level bosses. For new players, a quick explanation of the skill is you go to a Slayer Master and they tell you to defeat a number of a specific monster. And for each one you defeat, you get Slayer XP that's usually equal to or close to the amount of hit points that monster had. After you defeat the amount you were assigned, you won't gain any more Slayer XP from defeating any more, and you'll have to go back to a Slayer Master for a new task. This video is by no means an exhaustive list because it would take hours to go over literally every single possible tip for this skill. But as the title says, this is simply 10 tips every OSRS player should know for training Slayer. First tip on the list is Slayer points and the order to spend them. Every time you finish a Slayer task, you're awarded Slayer points, which you could spend in the rewards shop, which is accessible from any Slayer Master. The higher level the Master, the more points you'll generally get, except the level 1 Slayer Masters, Turil and Spria, you never get points from them. And you also never gain points from your first 4 Slayer tasks, but you do get bonus points for certain task milestones every 10th, 50th, 100th, 250th, and 1000th give multipliers. When you're starting out at a lower combat level and using a low level Slayer Master who gives low points, you really have to think about how you prioritize spending your points since they're slow to come by. If you get a task you don't like, you can spend 30 points to skip it, so I'd recommend always having an extra buffer of 60 or 90 points beyond anything else you're going to buy. Now the order to buy things, it can be subjective depending on who you ask, but I think everyone will agree that the first priority should always be bigger and badder, which unlocks the ability to get superiors. Superior monsters have a 1 in 200 chance of spawning whenever you defeat a slayer monster you're assigned, and they give a lot of slayer XP, usually in the thousands when you defeat them, and they have a chance at dropping the imbued heart, currently worth over 100 million GP. But really the main thing is that it increases your average Slayer XP per hour because you get those huge Slayer XP drops when you defeat them, and it's especially nice at earlier levels and it'll help boost you forward quicker. After that, I would save for blocks and extensions, and I'll talk about setting up a block list later in the video. If you're an Iron Man, I would get broader fletching next if you have a rune crossbow and 55 fletching, because broad bolts are super good for how early on you can get them. From there, the order is pretty subjective. You can unlock the ability to make Slayer Rings, which unlocks some teleports, or you can get the ability to make the Black Mask into the Slayer Helm, which will help for a couple tasks like Aberrant Spectres and Dust Devils. From the Buy tab, there's only two things worth buying, the Herb Sack to store 30 of every grimy herb, and the Rune Pouch to store three types of runes. You really should never spend Slayer points on anything else on this list, with a couple small exceptions, but nothing you need to worry about. The Herb Sack and Rune Pouch are convenience items to save inventory space that you'll definitely want to get eventually, but it's not a huge priority, and you don't even have to get them from Slayer. The Herb Sack you can get from Tithe Farm, and the Rune Pouch you can get from Last Man Standing. So if you end up finding you enjoy those minigames more than Slayer, then you should do the activity that you enjoy more to get those items. But for the most part, I really wouldn't stress too much about the order beyond the first couple things I mentioned, because the time that you spend standing around trying to figure out which one to buy next, you could have been training Slayer, earning more points to buy both the ones that you're trying to decide between. This leads us into the next topic on the list, point boosting, also called Turil boosting. Remember I mentioned every 10th task you get a bonus multiplier for Slayer points. Well, you can go to Turiel or Spria to get 9 tasks, and then every 10th, you go to the highest level Slayer Master you have access to to get the most Slayer points possible. Turiel and Spria are the same by the way, so I'll just say Turiel going forward. The reason why you do this is because Turiel, being the lowest level Slayer Master, assigns super quick low level tasks like goblins, cows, stuff like that. So if you're anywhere above a brand new player, you can complete 9 Turiel tasks very quickly to boost straight ahead to that 10th task at your main Slayer Master to get 
the big points boost. And on Turtle's page on the wiki, which I'll have all the wiki links in the description by the way, it'll even tell you the best location to get the task done as fast as possible. Even if you're not Turtle boosting, a lot of the players use their normal Slayer Master, Neve, or Duradel and then go to Konar for the point milestones. Konar is a weird exception because she's a mid-level Slayer Master but gives the most Slayer points. This is because she also gives you a specific location where you have to do your task, and sometimes the location might be far out of the way or you can't fight the boss version because of the location, or there might only be higher level variants of the monster that you don't want to fight. The only benefits with Konar are the Slayer points and also the rare chance for Brimstone Keys, which give access to a mid-level resource chest, which some mid-level Iron Man might find useful, or for high-level players, hunting Dusk Mystic on the collection log. But anyways, I'd recommend only using Konar for every 50th task and not every 10th, because if you have to skip even one extra task with Konar due to getting a bad location, you're already getting less points than if you just stuck with Neve or Duradel. One last thing to mention regarding Slayer points is if you're out of points but you want to skip your task, you can reset it with Turiel, but only Turiel, Spree does not work in this case. And when you reset, you'll be given a normal Turiel task, but you'll be reset to zero tasks. So really, you should never do this unless you're an endgame player looking for Zuck tasks, or maybe if you're a mid-level Iron Man going for your first Trident or Colt Necklace. Now let's go over how to set up a block list. Blocking a task means you'll never get that task assigned from any Slayer Master because the block list is shared across all of them, and it costs 100 Slayer points to add a task to your block list. You get more block slots available based on your quest points and if you've completed the Lumbridge Elite Diary up to a maximum of 7. You can unblock a monster at any time, but you won't get the points back. Remember, it costs 30 points to cancel, and I feel like when you cancel a task, it's for one of two reasons. First reason would be because you're not in the mood to do it at that specific time, or the second reason is it's a task that you just never do and don't plan to do it in the near future. If it's the second reason, then you should block it, because if you cancel the same task more than three times, then you're already losing more Slayer points than if you just had it blocked. Now the way you set up your block list is go to the wiki page for your Slayer Master that you generally use. Let's say you use Duradel, for example. On the wiki page for Duradel, it'll show every task he can possibly assign, and you can sort it by the weighting of the task. So you'll sort it from highest weighting to lowest weighting and start from the top of the list. Look at the first task on there and ask yourself, is this a task I'll ever do, or would I skip this one every time? If it's a task that you know you're going to skip every time, then boom, there's your first block. Then move on to the next one on the list, and if you don't have that task unlocked or available, then just skip over to the next one, and repeat that process until you have enough to fill up your block list. You can't actually block a monster until you get it assigned as your task, but this way you'll be prepared for the next time you get it to send it straight onto the list. There are technically efficient block lists depending on your goals, like maybe you're trying to go for maximum Slayer XP with barrage tasks, or maybe you're trying to get specific boss tasks, and so on. But for the average player, your block list is going to be based on your personal preference, so I wouldn't worry about efficiency, just think about whether or not you're personally going to actually do it or you're always going to skip it. Let's go over how to hunt for a specific task and which master to use. And it's important to know that for all the Slayer bosses, you could only fight them when you have a Slayer task for it. Whether you're going for a Slayer boss pet, or combat achievements, or you're looking for a high GP boss task, or if you're an Iron Man going for gear upgrades, at some point, most players will end up trying to go for a specific Slayer task, but all the Slayer Masters have different tasks and different weightings for those tasks. So how do you ensure that you're going to the Slayer Master that gives you the highest chance of getting the task you want? Well, we're going to head over to the wiki page for Slayer Task Waiting, and this will be in the description too. You can see this is a very in-depth calculator. It has you enter in certain stats, quests, and other miscellaneous things that you've completed in order to calculate the percent odds of you getting every task for each Slayer Master. And by the way, by the time you're at the point of hunting specific tasks, you're really only going to be deciding between Neve and Duradel, maybe Conor sometimes, but not really. So let's say, for example, you're trying to get Kraken tasks. I've got Neve selected here and if we scroll down, you'll see the odds of getting Cave Kraken from Neve is 3.39%. We'll go back up to the top, switch it over to Duradel, and you'll see the odds for Kraken from Duradel is 4.64%. So in this specific scenario, you'd be better off with Duradel. A common question players have is should they use Neve or Duradel for their main master? In general, I'd say you should always be using Duradel over Neve once you have him unlocked, unless of course you're going for a specific task where the weighting is higher with Neve, but just Generally, Duradel is the way to go. And that's the perfect segue into the next section, how to get to Slayer Masters. Some of their locations are self-explanatory.
self-explanatory how to get there, so I'm not going to explain how to get to Drainer Village, but I want to explain the methods of transportation that may not be so intuitive. First, with Turiel, you can use a games necklace or a combat bracelet to get to Berthorp to get to him quickly, and if you have 81 construction or a bit lower with boosts, you can build the basic jewelry box in the POH, which gives unlimited games necklace teleports. I haven't talked about Crystalia, the Wildy Slayer Master, but I do want to mention a fast way to get to Edgeville that's not a glory or a fairy ring, which is the minigames teleports of Soul Wars. You can use a minigames teleport every 20 minutes, and with this one, you just leave out the portal and you're in Edgeville. For Cheldar, there's really only one way to her, which is via fairy rings, but if you're using Cheldar, you probably don't have the construction level to build a fairy ring in your POH, so I want to mention a couple fast ways to get to fairy rings at a lower level. There's the classic Arty Cloak teleports the monastery and run east to the fairy ring that most players know about, but another thing you can do is be on the Archaeus spellbook, and there's a teleport with level 40 magic called Salve Graveyard Teleport that you can use if you have Priest and Peril done. This is a super close fairy ring teleport that I feel like is underutilized, especially by low level Ironmen. And even better, if you don't want to be on the Archaeus spellbook, you can build a portal in your house with level 50 construction that will give you unlimited teleports there and you can be on any spellbook. So you can be on the regular spellbook for house teleports and access a fairy ring pretty quickly that way. For Konar, the Rada's Blessing 3 from the current Har Diary gives 3 daily teleports to her, while the Rada's Blessing 4 from the Elite Diary gives unlimited teleports. There's also a fairy ring code CIR below the mountain, or at level 23 magic you can use the Battlefront teleport on the Archaeus spellbook which isn't too far either. If you don't have Rada's Blessing, it is a bit of a trek up the mountain, but if you're only getting tasks from her for every 50th, then it won't add any significant time if you don't have the direct teleport with the Blessing. The best way to get to Neve is with the Slayer Ring teleport, but if you don't have them unlocked yet, then the Spirit Tree is pretty close too. By the time you have Neve unlocked, you may not have a Spirit Tree in your POH, but you should have the Varak Medium Diary done to use the GE teleport, and in the northeast corner of the GE is a Spirit Tree. So now you've got the secret Iron Man tips to getting to Fairy Rings and Spirit Trees quickly. Lastly, for Duradel, the Karamji Gloves 3 teleports you to the Gem Mine, which is a bit of a run, but it's not too bad. Or with the Karamji Gloves 4, it's a direct teleport to Duradel. Honestly, by the time you have Duradel unlocked, you really should have the Karamji Gloves 3. If you don't, then you should take a break from slaying with your combat bracelet and Abi Cape to at least get the Karamja Hard Diary done before going on, even if you do have NPC Contact unlocked, which is the final part of this section. NPC Contact requires 67 magic and Lunar Diplomacy because you have to be on the Lunar Spellbook. And using this spell, you can access any Slayer Master to get a new task without actually having to go to them. Next thing to go over is how to quickly gear up for your Slayer task. Most players have a tab in the bank for their gear and potions, but with the Inventory Setups plugin, you can set custom loadouts that will isolate what to take out from your bank. Let's make an example setup real quick. So I took all these items out of my bank, I'm going to go into the plugin and click the plus icon and add new setup and we'll just label it test. Now I'll deposit everything back into the bank and we'll search for our new test setup in the plugin. Make sure the leftmost icon is highlighted to enable bank filtering and now when I press the I to show the setup while I have my bank open, all the items appear. We can even take this a step further and also use the Bank Tag Layouts plugin. This makes all the items appear in one big tab and it even auto organizes the items for you each time you search for one of your setups. There's a lot of small ways you can tweak and adjust these two plugins to work with each other, so I'd recommend you fiddle with the settings and get them functioning in a way that works best for you. One more little tip is that you can right click any slot in the plugin to toggle fuzzy and this will show all variations of that item in the bank. So it'll show Barrow's items with like 25, 50, 75, 100, or it'll show jewelry with all the different charges, stuff like that. Let's talk about doing Barrage Slayer slash Burst Slayer. Certain tasks are in multi-combat and easily stackable. Each time you run through a monster, it becomes invisible for one more monster to stack underneath it. So you can aggro a bunch of monsters in a multi-combat area, run back and forth to stack them all underneath each other, and hit them all at once by using Ancients with Burst or Barrage spells. This leads to not only massive magic XP, but also Slayer XP and it's much faster than traditional melee slayer attacking one at a time. A lot of players don't gear properly for Barrage Slayer and we're mystics. 
Don't do that. The most important thing when doing Barrage Slayer first is magic damage, like Virtus or Ancestral. Most players, especially Iron Man, don't have full sets of magic damage boosting gear because it's rare and expensive. So what you want to do instead for the slots that you don't have magic damage boosting gear is wear your best prayer boosting gear. Generally, this is going to be Proselyte, and on screen, you can see me rocking a typical mid-level account bursting setup. The reason why you want prayer bonus instead of magic accuracy is because the monsters you burst for Slayer have basically no defense against magic. You having higher magic attack only means higher accuracy, not higher damage, and lower defense for a monster you're fighting against also only means higher accuracy and not higher damage. So because you're already going to be super accurate, having magic attack boosting gear won't make any noticeable difference to your DPS. So instead, that's why you want to wear the prayer gear in the slots you don't have the magic damage gear, so that way you can minimize your usage of prayer pots and save GP or supplies if you're an iron. The imbued or saturated heart is huge for Barrage Slayer because it increases your magic level, which would increase your damage. It's over 100 mil, but you know, you get what you pay for if you can't afford it. With normal AFK melee Slayer, you're probably getting like 20k Slayer XP per hour, but when you get a barrage task, you should easily be getting at least 60k Slayer XP per hour. And if you want to start bursting for Slayer, make sure you extend Dust Devils and Neck Reels so you can have those be as long of a task as possible because those are really the main two barrage tasks you're going to get. And speaking of extending Slayer tasks, the next tip is about Slaughter Bracelets and Expeditious Bracelets. These are items that go in the glove slot, so you are sacrificing a bit of DPS from not having Barrow's gloves on, but it's definitely a worthwhile sacrifice for boosting your Slayer XP or your Slayer points. With the Expeditious Bracelet, each time you kill a monster on your Slayer task, it has a 25% chance of counting as two monsters for your task. You don't get any extra XP, this is simply a way to get your tasks done faster, and this allows you to get Slayer points quicker, or get through the tasks that you don't like faster. The Slaughter Bracelet is the opposite. It gives a 25% chance that a monster won't count towards your Slayer task when you kill it, but you will still get the normal XP. Because of the way math works, you're saving 25% of kills, but you still have the chance to save on the kills that you saved. So rather than extending your Slayer task by 25% on average that you would think, it actually makes you extend your task by 33% on average. Besides for the early levels, you really should always be using one or the other, except maybe if you're on a boss task where you want to maximize your DPS. Technically, you can wear your DPS gloves and then switch to the Slaughter or Expeditious bracelet at the last second, and then after it dies, then you switch back to your B gloves or whatever you had. But most people don't want to put in the effort for that, and they just keep their bracelet on the whole time. But yeah, really, you should always wear them because either you want a task done faster because you don't like it but refuse to spend points on skipping, or it's a task that you do like for one reason or another, maybe it's super AFK and that's your thing, or it's a barrage task and you want to extend them, or you're an Iron Man going for your first trident. There really shouldn't be any in-between, and I'd recommend you make up your mind about every Slayer task if, for you personally, it's a skip, expeditious, or slaughter task. Last thing I want to mention about them is the charges. They start with 30 charges, but it only takes away a charge when it actually activates for a monster. So generally, you'll go through like 2-3 to three of them per task since they get destroyed when they run out. But if you have the elite combat achievements done, there is a 10% chance that when the charges run out, it restores back to full rather than getting deleted. Number 9 on the list is like a weird low-level Iron Man tip, or you could consider it a budget Slayer tip to save money for normal accounts. Most Slayer tasks you do will be done in the catacombs in Proselyte, Prayer Gear. You can save the monster until your prayer runs out. Instead of having to use prayer pots, especially if you don't really have that many at that stage, you can teleport to your POH to restore prayer instead. It's only level 45 construction that you need to build the lowest tier of the altar to restore prayer. If you do have higher stats though, if you have 85 construction or maybe a bit lower with boosts, you can build the restoration pool which restores special attack, run, prayer, and reduced stats. So you can use the Dragon Battle Axe special attack, which boosts strength but lowers your other stats, sip from the pool to bring the lowered stats back up, and then sip a super attack. And because you're praying, your defense doesn't matter, so you don't need to use super defense potions. But yeah, from there you can use the Karen Teleport either from your spellbook or a portal in your POH to get you right back to the catacombs. For Iron Man, you get way more super attacks than super strengths. Not that super strengths are that hard to come by, but you'll end up with noticeably way more super attacks than strengths, and this is one way you could balance them out. Because if you're coming back to your POH to restore prayer when your prayer runs out anyways, 
then you may as well utilize the Dragon Battle Axe while you're at it. Side note, before moving on, the whole restoring prayer at your POH thing is not an efficient thing to do. Even for Iron Man, you'd be better off in the long run thieving Master Farmers for Ranars and making prayer pots and getting Herblore XP. But everyone has a different play style, and hopefully this kind of weird, unique tip helps or inspires a few people in the way that they enjoy the game. And finally, on to number 10, I want to talk about weapons or similar gear that helps with Slayer. And this is all going to be for higher level Slayer, so if you're newer, don't stress about this now, you can come back to it way later on. The first thing is the Ceridoman God Sword Special Attack. It uses 50% spec, and it heals your health and prayer based on how much damage you hit with it. When you combine this with the Lightbearer Ring, which makes your special attack restore twice as fast, you can do a full DK's task in one trip, or tasks where you normally eat food, like maybe gargoyles, you can easily do the whole task without leaving for more food. Another example is for the fight caves, the SGS and Lightbearer combo is also useful. Even for monsters immune to the SGS, like Kurasks, it will do zero damage, but it'll still heal you based on how much damage that you rolled. Next up is the Din's Bulwark special attack. It uses 50% spec and it hits all the monsters up to five tiles away from you in every direction. This is especially useful for Barrage Slayer because it makes them all aggro you so you don't have to throw darts to aggro them one by one. I found that with the Light Bearer, you'll have a spec for every round of neck reels, but for Dust Devils, because they're faster to kill, you don't get the full 50% spec back with them, so every few rounds of dust devils you'll still have to aggro them the old-fashioned way. A super useful main hand weapon for Slayer is the Venator Bow, which is obviously ranged. In multi-combat areas, it bounces each arrow to make it hit up to three monsters. And if you're more of an AFK player, this is amazing because a lot of monsters aren't aggressive, like Blood Delves or Abbey Demons. All you have to do is click one monster, and the arrows will keep on aggroing more monsters in the area as they come close and even as you kill them, they'll respawn and the arrows will aggro them again. So theoretically, you could be able to click once and do a full Slayer task. I mean, you'll want to drink Prayer Pot every once in a while to keep your prayer up, but besides for that, it's kind of as if there is like an aggression potion in the game. Uh, the Ancient Mace from another Slice of Ham quest. Kind of a meme, but I'm sure there's at least one impoverished OSRS player watching this video right now. So, the special attack uses 100% spec and restores your prayer by the damage that you do, and it can even restore above your max prayer points. If you build a dummy in your POH, you always do your max hit when you attack it. So before you start your AFK Slayer trip, you can use the Ancient Mace spec on the dummy to get maximum boosted prayer points. Also, just like with the SGS, it can't damage Karasks, but it will still restore prayer points based on the damage you would have dealt. I figure most players know about the Black Mask, but just in case, the Black Mask is pretty much the best piece of gear for Slayer because it gives massive bonuses, but only when you're fighting your Slayer task. It's 16.67% melee accuracy and strength, and once you imbue it, which you should try to do ASAP, it also gives 15% bonus to ranged accuracy and ranged strength, and 15% bonus to magic accuracy and magic damage. And once you unlock the ability to make the Slayer Helm, it adds all the Slayer headgear into it, like a nose peg, earmuffs, and so on, so that you can use it for any Slayer tasks, even if they require a head slot item. I saved the best for last, the cannon. If you're a main account, you should always use the cannon everywhere you can, whether it's single combat or multi-combat. You can't use it in certain in areas like the catacombs or slayer tower but man combining the cannon with the venner bow for like cow fight or dagnoth tasks my god the cannon also kind of works as an aggression potion too since it can aggro all the monsters in the area or even in single combat zones it's still gonna be aggroing one monster onto you that may not have been aggressive otherwise there's a runelite plugin called cannon that has a lot of useful options in the settings. It'll show you where to stand for double hit spots, and the plugin will show you the optimal tile to place your cannon down for common cannoning locations. And the higher the tier of combat achievements you have completed, the more cannonballs the cannon will be able to hold, up to 60 with the elite tier, rather than the default of 30. Apparently it's always controversial when I say this, but making cannonballs to use the cannon is not efficient for Iron Man to do. In the time it would take you to make the cannonballs for a Slayer task, you could have already completed that Slayer task, and been halfway through the next one. Let's say you have the double cannonball mold. At max efficiency, you're making like 4,500 cannonballs per hour, but you're not going to be making them at max efficiency because that would defeat the
defeat the purpose of making cannonballs in the first place. And it's also going by the assumption that you already have the steel bars. You're not going to have unlimited steel bars to sustain this method for very long, and pretty quickly, if you want to keep on making cannonballs, you'll get to the point where you need to buy iron and coal from the blast furnace shop, then you have to take the time smelting the steel bars at blast furnace before finally having to spend more time to make them into the cannonballs. I mean, besides the GP you have to spend, you're effectively probably making maybe 2k cannonballs per hour doing that whole process. People say they only make cannonballs when they have AFK time. Doing that whole process, I wouldn't really call AFK, but even just the cannonball making part is only 78 seconds, a minute, and 18 seconds of AFK. When you go to do Slayer, you can AFK for way more than a minute, especially in the catacombs with Proslate. You can go AFK for probably the whole 10 minute de aggro timer, or at the very least, maybe you have to sip a Pyridos. If you need something that's AFK to do, instead of making cannonballs that's only like just over a minute of AFK time, there's so many other methods that are more AFK and get you more XP, like training Slayer, or chopping redwoods, or fishing pretty much anything. I mean, there's so many activities that provide more idle time while also earning you more XP and further progress your account than just having cannonballs. So that's my spiel for Iron Men that are thinking about making cannonballs. But at the end of the day, you should play the game how you want and do what you enjoy. I'm here to give you my Slayer advice, and I just want you to be aware of the alternatives and how certain methods fit better into the macro picture of progressing your account. I also just remembered another tip, so quick bonus tip number 11, the NPC Aggression Timer plugin. When NPCs de-aggro you, if you walk out of the highlighted zone, it'll reset the timer back to 10 minutes, so you'll have another full 10 minutes of aggression time again. Alright, I covered all the main things I wanted to cover. So, as you adventure out into the world to fight new monsters for the first time, you'll discover lots of different methods of transportation around the game. And if you're newer to OSRS, I know all the information and constantly learning new things can be overwhelming, but like with everything else in life, you learn as you go. Every single person that's ever played this game started out with no knowledge about OSRS whatsoever. And don't stress about trying to be perfect with everything you do, unless you're an Iron Man making cannonballs, then you should feel bad. Nah, I'm just kidding. Kinda. But gradually, over time, you'll be making subtle micro-adjustments to the way you play without even knowing it. You won't even notice on a day-to-day -day basis how much you're learning and progressing. So have fun in the game, do the things you enjoy, play the way you like to, learn from your mistakes, tell yourself better late than never, and most importantly, learn to appreciate the happy little accidents.